All right, ladies and gentlemen, here I go. Another video I wasn't initially going to make, but you guys kept asking for it, so I felt like I didn't really have a choice. So here it is, a video about Days of Ruin. Often considered the black sheep of the Advanced Wars games. A very strange attempt to take an established and well-liked franchise and completely reinvent it with a much darker spin. Gone are the silly days of Andy asking what an airport is, and in its place we instead get horrifying stories of people actually getting killed in a post-apocalyptic hellscape, with deadly diseases that causes flowers to sprout from their dead bodies. Yeah, Days of Ruin is very grim. And I for one actually appreciate how they took a gamble and dared to tread on new soil instead of just endlessly recycling what worked in the past. Now, with Dual Strike getting some rather lackluster sales numbers, I do believe Intelligent Systems felt they had to do so something. And while Days of Ruin wasn't a smash hit, it was a very interesting take on the Wars franchise, with many new and incredibly interesting mechanics. However, one of the reasons I think Days of Ruin didn't quite hit the mark among the player base was actually due to the game's battle animations. They just don't look that good. Just compare them to the vibrant and colorful battles of the older games, and they just kinda look static and weird. I honestly think that if Days of Ruin had better looking animations, it would probably have been way better received. Still, despite these lack cluster graphics, Days of Ruin have generated a bit of a cult following in the years after its release. It may not have a huge fan base, but those who like it, really like it. Some even claiming it is the best Advanced Wars games in the series by far. And while I will always have a special place in my heart for the original ones, I have to admit that Days of Ruin have some really cool mechanics, along with gorgeous CO designs and probably the most spectacular soundtrack I've ever heard in any Advanced Wars game. So in this video, I'm going to be doing something that I don't feel super qualified to do, but I'm going to try it anyway. I'll be rating the CEOs of Days of Ruin into various tiers depending on their strengths. S rank, A rank, B rank, C rank, and D rank. But just be aware that my experience with Days of Ruin is not as extensive as with the other Advanced Wars games. So take my ratings with a pinch of salt. Honestly, this video should be looked at more of a prediction on how strong I think the COs are based on my experience with Advanced Wars as a whole. I would like to add that I have played through the campaign of Days of Ruin multiple times, and I played a good portion of multiplayer matches against other humans. So I have a good grasp on how this game plays out, but I would not claim to be very experienced or knowledgeable about the Meta game, so please bear that in mind as you watch this video. Anyway, before we begin with the ratings themselves, I want to briefly explain how COs and CO powers work in Days of Ruin, because to people only experienced with the older games, these mechanics can actually be incredibly confusing. In the older Advanced Wars games, the choice of CO was something you did at the start of the match, and the COs would just passively boost certain units in your army, and sometimes nerfing others. Each CO had a power that, when activated, would give them a short-term boost of some kind, and this power would just passively charge itself up whenever you fought. There was little reason not to use it once you had it ready. In Days of Ruin, however, your CO is actually deployed directly onto the battlefield, into a unit of your choice. You do this by moving said unit over a base and selecting the CO command. When a CO joins a unit, two things happen. The first is that the unit will automatically rank up to max level. Units in Days of Ruin ranks up in strength whenever they score a kill each rank giving them a 10% firepower and defense boosts, for a maximum of 30% at rank 3. The second thing that happens when a CO joins a unit is that you will now see a leadership zone appear around the unit itself. This is called the CO zone. Various commanders have various CO zones, some only having a range of 1 to 2, while others can go as high as 5. The commander will, for example, have a range of 2, meaning his CO zone affects every unit within 2 tiles of him. Every CO zone in the game, regardless of its range, will passively buff any unit nearby with a 10% firepower and defense boost. But most COs also have a secondary effect that only affects specific units. Will, for example, will buff any direct ground combat units by giving them 20% extra firepower, meaning his infantry and tanks will receive this firepower bonus, but not his battlecopters, for example. This is supposed to reflect the sort of units the CO is proficient with. So with Will, you generally want to focus most of your attention on ground units, and you most likely want to deploy him in a unit such as a tank. However, the CO zone can also level up. As you keep fighting and destroying enemy units within your own CO zone, you can increase its range. Each CO zone can level up twice. This means that Will can get his range up to 4. And when this happens, you will get the choice to use your CO power by selecting the unit that your CO is currently joined with. 
Keep in mind that you have to do this before moving the unit, so if it's already attacked, you can't use your CO power. When your power is activated, your CO zone becomes global for one turn, applying its buffs to every single unit you have. In addition, you get a unique effect based on your commander. Will, for example, buffs his direct ground unit's movement by two for one turn. However, after you use your CO power, your CO zone goes back to its normal range and you have to start the process of building it up again. Due to the way your CO zone works in Days of Ruin, you can actually go an entire match without ever seeing a CO power activated. Sometimes you simply want to hold on to your max range CO zone, as its passive benefits are more valuable long term compared to the quick burst of momentum you get from using your CO power once. Also, if the unit you deploy your CO into gets destroyed, your CO merely retreats, and you have to go back and deploy him or her into a new unit. When this happens, the CO zone also gets reduced back to its original size. This means that taking out the enemy CO unit becomes a very viable strategy, and you also have to guard your own CO unit, while weighing the benefits of using such a strong unit to gain an advantage in battle, even if it means risking it. This turns Days of Ruin into a game similar to chess, where each player has a king they need to watch over, only that losing this king is merely a big setback and not an instant game over. In Days of Ruin, the choice of which unit you load your CO into is one of the most important ones you'll make. You can either load it into a strong ground unit like a war tank and use it to destroy your enemies, or you might take a more passive approach, loading your CO into an indirect unit such as an artillery or a rocket, making it easier to keep said unit alive. Hell, I've even seen some players load their CO's into non-combat units like flares, merely relying on the CO zone and eventually their CO power to win the day. I also want to add that some commanders in this game actually don't have CO powers at all. Some of them have CO zones that are so strong that the zones themselves are their whole utility. I will talk more about them later on in the video when we get there. Alright, so with that very lengthy explanation out of the way, it's finally time to begin ranking the CO's. Let's go! So up first today we come to the commander Will, and uh, he's supposed to be the relatable CO of this game. He's basically the Andy, well, minus the stupidity I guess. He's kind of like the CO that every beginner is supposed to play first, he's very easy to play. But of course, while Andy was kind of like a jack of all trades master of none type CO, Will isn't really anything like that. There's really no commander like that in Days of Ruin because there's no weaknesses. I mean, I guess there's one, but he comes later, so we'll talk about him when he shows up. So, Will is actually a pretty good commander. I, I rate him as a B rank tier CEO. Now, uh, I've already talked a little bit about his basic powers and abilities when talking about how CO zones work, but I'll do a basic recap of his abilities. So Will is like a ground unit specialist. Uh, he has a CO range of 2, so that means his zone will eventually grow to range 4 once it's fully charged up. And the buff that he gives is pretty simple. He just buffs ground units, direct ground units, by 20% firepower. So this will affect his infantry, his mechs, his tanks, his anti-air. Pretty much anything that's on the ground and attacks will get buffed by a CO zone. Now this is incredibly good, because ground units will make up the main composition of any advanced force army. You know, ground units are the meat and bulk of the gameplay, basically. You know, you'll have some air units on some maps, maybe some naval units, uh, if it's like a high economy map, but ground units will always be present, and so CO's that buff ground units will always have an edge over CO's that don't, in my opinion. And one of the things that makes Will incredibly dangerous is the fact that his capture game is very strong, especially on smaller maps, because his CO zone buffs his infantry. So if you're playing on like a very small map with just a few properties, then that CO zone will be incredibly hard to go up against, unless you got a really strong CO zone of your own. And for that reason, I think Will is actually an incredibly strong commander. Now he also has a very, very good CO power, Rallying Cry. It buffs his direct ground units by giving them plus two movement. And, I mean, if you know anything about movement in Advanced Wars, I mean, you know how strong this can be. It essentially doubles the movement range of his mechs, turning them into incredibly effective traders. Like, man, it almost sounds like I think, think they're trading stocks, but when I say traders, I basically mean that, you know, his mechs can just, like, move really far, take a really good hit against enemy tanks, and just get a really good cost-effective trade. So, again, with Will, he's... Kind of like a mech spammer on smaller maps, like that's definitely what, what you want to do. Uh, mechs are even a little bit cheaper in Days of Ruin, which I think is incredibly odd. They cost 2,500 instead of 3,000, but I do believe they are a little bit less effective. And you also have the inclusion of bikes in this game, which is a, an incredibly fast-moving infantry unit. So most of the games that I've played in Days of Ruin have mostly been focused on bikes, at least on the bigger maps. 
So, but still, if, if I'm playing Will on a very small map, uh, I will definitely build a lot of mechs and try to utilize that plus two movement once I get my power to get a lot of really good trades. And again, I mean, Will is just a pretty simple CO to play, you know? It's, it's very easy to get value out of a CO zone that buffs direct ground units. Just load him into a tank, that's a, always a good move, and just go ham with his power. Just enjoy that firepower increase. 20% is pretty solid, and uh, yeah, Will is just an incredibly easy, simple, but a very effective CO to play. He's incredibly good in this game. And then we come to Captain Brenner. And in case you guys didn't catch it, he's very good and honorable, you guys. He is the goodest, honorablest CO in the world. He loves defending the, the weak and upholding justice. Yeah, as much as I like the story of Days of Ruin, it is incredibly black and white with its characters. Either they are like the most virtuous goody two-shoe characters ever, or they're like comically hilariously evil. It's like, on one side you got like, I defend all weak, and then the other guy goes like, I kick kittens, ha ha ha. It's like, I don't know, I, I, that part of Days of Ruin does bother me a little bit, but aside from that, it's a really good game. Uh, so yeah, Brenner, really handsome guy, love his design. He's also a really strong commander, I rate him a B-rank tier CO in this game. So Brenner, he works very simply. He has a very big CO zone, it has a range of 3, which means that when fully powered up, it can reach the maximum range of 5, which is incredibly good. And it buffs every single unit within range, giving it 20% extra defense. And that's incredibly good, I mean, not only is it a big CO zone, but it's a good effect as well, and it's an effect that affects every single unit that you have. I mean, it means pushing through Brenner's CO zone is incredibly hard. And it is also incredibly hard to take down his CO unit. So keep in mind, once you load your CO into a unit, it gets a 30% firepower and defense boost. You add the CO zone on top of that. That means Brenner's CO unit has a 50% increase to its defense, meaning it takes half damage. It's very hard to punch through it. This makes it a lot easier for you to keep him alive. You can load him into a really strong unit like a war tank, for example. And the enemy will have to focus fire that war tank a lot to bring it down. So for that reason, it's a lot easier for, for Brenner to build up his CO power. Which is, it's not very good in my opinion, but it can be situationally useful, it's called Reinforce. And it's a slightly better version of Andy's power from the earlier Advanced Force game. It restores 3 HP to all of his units. I don't think this power is a power that you should like pop as soon as you get it. This is a situationally useful power. If you have a lot of injured units on the field, which you're statistically very likely to have since Brenner has extra defense, so his units will just live longer. So it, it is a CO power that synergizes very well with his day-to-day -day abilities, I will give him that. But 3 HP, as good as it can be, uh, it's not something that you will just instantly pop. I would say that you need at least like four to five injured units for this to be viable. Of course, if those units happen to be very high cost units, like war tanks, then you should definitely pop reinforce as soon as you get it. But if it's just for like, healing a unit here and there, I think I would rather hold on to the 5 range CO zone that he has, because I think that will be that will give you more value over the course of a long match. Now, of course, if you pop this power, then Brenner's CO zone will become global, which means that every single one of your units will enjoy a 20% defense boost for that turn, which can be incredibly good, but if you're playing for the long game, if it's a long match that's going to drag out for a very long time, I would definitely sit on my CO zone until I saw that I got a lot of value out of this power. So definitely something to keep in mind. I would also like to add that there is definitely something different about the way Days of Ruin calculates his defense compared to the earlier games. I did some research online, I read some forum posts, I did some simulations in the game itself to try and figure out exactly what it is. It seems that when defense is given in smaller quantities, it works pretty similarly to the older games. However, when defense starts to rise incredibly high, there does seem to be a difference in how the game calculates it. I just want to add that. Uh, I wasn't able to find anything conclusive on it, but there's a CO later on that really buffs the defense of his air units, and that's when I definitely started to notice it. So, I just want to add that right now. There seems to be something different about the way Days of Ruin calculates his defense. Maybe someone in the comment section can help me elaborate on this, because I wasn't able to find something super tangible, but something that I just want to add, since we're talking about defense. But yeah, Brenner, I mean, he's a good commander, for sure. Very easy to play, very hard to take out. Defense is an incredibly good stat, especially when combined with terrain, and there's a lot of terrain in Days of Ruin, so... You know, he's just an incredibly easy CO to play, very hard to punch through, and he allows you to play a little bit more recklessly with your CO unit, because you get that juicy defense, and again, I really like it when your CO unit is incredibly hard to take down. So yeah, strong commander.
And up next, we come to the Fog of War Specialist, Lynn. And, uh, ooh, Hamana, Hamana, why are the females so hot in this game? I mean, Jesus Christ. Uh, she's an incredibly strong commander in this game. She's an a rank tier CO. At least, that's what I think she is. I mean, I've only played a handful of matches as Lynn, but it was enough for me to just realize just how broken she is. So, Lynn has a very short CO zone. It only has a range of one, which means that it only buffs her CO unit and any unit directly adjacent to it. And this is a little tricky, but then you see what the CO zone does. It gives her both 20% firepower and 20% defense to every single ground unit. And this is incredibly good. I mean, Will had 20% extra firepower, Brenner had 20% extra defense, Lynn just gets both of those bonuses. And when you combine firepower and defense together, it just creates an incredibly good CO. I mean, this is one of the reasons why Kambai is so overpowered in the earlier games, because he has both firepower and defense. And it just double dips in a way that just makes it incredibly hard to deal with. And of course, while Lin doesn't get a very big CO zone, her CO unit becomes incredibly strong. It has, in total, 50% extra firepower and 50% extra defense. So it, it, it is as tough to kill as Brenner's unit, but it also has incredibly high firepower. And once you reach 50% increased firepower, it becomes incredibly easy for you to one-shot units, and this will build up your CO power incredibly quickly. I would say this is one of the weaknesses that Brenner has uh, compared to, to Lin, is the fact that he only gets extra defense, so it's not as easy for him to kill units, and so he won't get a CO power as quickly. And of course, once you start building up Lin's CO zone and it starts to get increased range, that's when you'll notice just how strong it is. Yeah, sure, it sucks that it starts out with one range. It really does. But oh man, once it grows to two and even three range and you have that 20% extra firepower and defense, man, it becomes incredibly good. Now, Lin also has one of the best CO powers in the game. It increases the vision range of her units by two. Now, uh, this is very similar to how Sonya used to work in the previous games. In addition to doing this, it also allows her to see units hidden. And here's the thing, this is probably one of the biggest changes with the Days of Ruin gameplay. In Days of Ruin, there are two additional terrain types which allows you to hide units. In Advanced Wars, or in the previous Advanced Wars games, you can only hide units in forests and reefs. But in Days of Ruin, you actually have much more terrain to hide your units in. Every single city on the map works like forests now which is incredible. So that means you put a unit on top of a city, it will be hidden and, and, and the enemy will need to scout it out. This makes cities probably one of the best terrain types to have in Days of Ruin because not only will it give you hit points back, not only will it give you defense, but it also will allow you to hide your units. So for example, putting a rocket on a city in Days of Ruin is so incredibly good because you're both hiding it and protecting it and constantly resupplying it, which is just incredible. In addition to that, you got a new type of terrain called Ruins, which don't give you a lot of defense, but they're basically kind of like places where you can hide your units. They're very hard to traverse. They slow your units down a lot, so they're very like annoying types of terrain, but you can hide your units there. So they're kind of like forests, but without the added defense. Sort of, that's how I classify them. There's also actually a third terrain type, which I forgot about, and that's the fog that is above the waters. Uh, you can hide your naval units there. So again, uh, lots of hiding spaces in Days of Ruin. Now, of course, they did compensate for this by giving you the flare unit, uh, and the flare unit is also an incredibly broken unit that allows you to, like, scout uh, an area on the map. However, when Lin pops her power, she can see everything. Now, it says on the wiki, I actually th found a mistake on the wiki, it says it, she can only look into reefs and forests, but this is this is not true, I tested it out. She can see into cities as well. She can see into all kinds of terrain once she pops her power. So she basically just gets full vision. And of course, don't, also keep in mind that she also makes her CO zone global for a turn, which means that it's like a super good Sonya power. Not only does it give her extra vision and allows her to see into hiding spots, but it also gives every single unit that she has on the map 20% extra firepower and defense for one turn. So it's a really broken CO power. And because Lin has a lot of extra firepower, it's a lot easier for her to build it up. You know, you put her inside a really strong unit, you just go around one-shotting things with it, you just build up that CO zone. And honestly, like, as, as good it is as good as it is for Lin to have a CO or like a fully powered up CO zone of three which gives her units 20% extra firepower and defense I would actually say that her power is so good that I would pop it almost immediately once I get it especially if there's a lot of cities and enemy units hiding on those cities on your turn because you can just do a monster push with that kind of power so yeah uh, Lin is an incredibly good CO in this game even though his CO zone starts out incredibly small once it grows it will be incredibly tough to go up against her So up next, we come to the CO with maybe the most out-of-place sounding CO theme in the entire game, in Isabella. 
You know, every other commander in Days of Ruin has this gritty, like, rock or metal sounding music, like, and in comes Isabella, like, it's like, is this even the same game? I mean, she seems so out of place. But yeah, Isabella, she's ridiculous. Uh, she is probably the second best commander in Days of Ruin, by far. Like, she is ridiculous. Um, she is an A-rank tier commander in this game. And the thing about Isabella that makes her kind of interesting is the fact that her day-to-day -day powers are very weak, but she makes up for it by having maybe the best power in the game. Probably the best power in the game. So Isabella's day-to-day -day CO zone is very weak. It only has a range of two, which it's not fantastic. It's not bad, but you know, it's like in the middle. Uh, but the thing is, she only gets the vanilla effect to her CO zone that every other CO has. So the only thing her CO zone does is the standard plus 10% defense and plus 10% firepower that every unit gets. This is something that all COs share. Even if you have a CO zone that only buffs air units, for example, every other unit will still get the baseline plus 10% firepower and defense. It's like the vanilla CO effect, and that's what Isabel has. It's not particularly big, and it's not particularly strong. So you can't really rely on her CO zone to win the day. However, in comes Deep Strike, maybe the most broken power in Days of Ruin. It gives all of her units plus two movement and all of her indirect units plus two range. And these are just two powers which should not be combined together into one. Plus two movement on its own would have been really broken. The fact that her indirects also get plus two range is even more ridiculous. Sure, they only get the plus 10% firepower and defense boosts. Like, it's not like she gets a firepower increase on top of that, but these two effects on their own just... They're so incredibly good. And movement increases in Days of Ruin are incredibly rare. Very few CO possesses movement uh, increasing powers, and you really do feel it when you go up against Isabelle. Like, the crazy mobility that her army gets, like, she just gets to walk all over the map, cap properties, move her units around, and her rockets and artillery and battleships will just turn into hunter-seeker missiles. It's incredible. So when you play as Isabella, like, your number one objective is to keep your CO unit alive. You do not want to put her into a tank or anything that's going to be on the front lines and be at the risk of being taken down because due to the fact that her CO unit isn't particularly strong, if you do put her into like a tank, then your opponent will focus fire that tank with everything they got. So when I was playing against Panzergraf on stream, I think it's many months ago now, uh, he actually did something incredibly genius, which I think a lot of Isabella players do, and that's the fact that he just put her into a flare. <laughs> he put her into a flare, put her in the back of his army, and he just made sure that he took engagements within his CO zone. And it was incredibly hard for me to get to the flare because it was in the back. And he just stayed there and just built up his power, popped Deep Strike, and won the game that way. So, again, this is incredibly hard to fight. I mean, yeah, sure, you can try and pun punch through your uh, her front lines and try to get to her CO unit in the back. But if you fail to do that for whatever reason, I mean, her Deep Strike is going to come in and it's going to suck for you. I mean, honestly, if Isabella gets Deep Strike, you're, you're screwed. That, that's how I prefer to view it. If you can take out her CO unit, then you will probably win the match. If she gets her deep strike, she wins. And more often than not, if you're up against a skilled player, they're gonna find a way to get their deep strike. If they really focus everything they have on just keeping their CO unit safe, chances are you're not going to be able to kill it unless something really strange happens, especially considering how many ways there are to hide your units in Days of Ruin. Like, like every single city works like a forest in that game, and you have ruins and everything, like your wasteland, which reduces mobility. So Days of Ruin is just a very easy game to play defensive in, and as a result, Isabella is just an incredibly strong commander. So up next, we come to one of the game's two air specialist commanders. We have Tasha. I like to call her the aggressive air commander because there are two of them and the other one focuses on defense. So yeah, Tasha, she focuses on aggressive air units, uh, but she's not a very good commander. I know I'm going to make a lot of Tasha fanboys angry when I say this, but she's a C rank tier commander. I don't find her that good. Her CO zone is very small. It's about the only thing about her that's small. <laughs> a boob joke. Anyway, uh, so yeah, as I said, she has a very small CO zone of 1, so she only buffs her CO unit as well as any units directly adjacent to her, just like Lin. So if the CO zone is small, well, it should be pretty powerful, right? And I mean, it is. It buffs attack by 40% and defense by 20%, which is ridiculous. But then you see that it only affects air units, and this is where it starts to get problematic, because... Here's the thing about air units. Um, the air game in Days of Ruin is a little bit different uh, compared to the older games because you have a new unit in the Duster, which is kind of like a, 
I would call it like a mini fighter that is very good at dealing with other aircraft as well as infantry units, but it's very bad against vehicles. But the Duster is a very interesting unit. However, even though the air game has changed up a little bit in terms of introducing a new troop unit into the early game, how you utilize air units in Days of Ruin still hasn't changed all that much from the older games. Air units don't tend to travel in clusters. And what I mean by that is that if you look at the role that Battlecopters, Dusters, and other units play, very often it is to make quick surprise attacks and then to get pulled back. That is usually how you want to use air units. Air units don't travel in big clumps. So in order to really benefit from Tasha's CO zone, you need to clump your Battlecopters together, and that's generally not a very good idea. Battlecopters benefit from being spread out in multiple locations, because that forces the enemy to build multiple anti-air units to counter them. If you have all your Battlecopters in one location, a single anti-air unit can zone them all out. If your Battlecopters are spread across the map, then you're forcing your opponent to, to spread his anti-air out across the map. And generally, you want to move your Battlecopters into areas where there are no anti-air. And this is why I don't like a CO zone that just buffs air units. Now, the, the attack buff is ridiculous. I mean, plus 40% is insane. And it needs to be specified that when Tasha loads herself into a Battlecopter, for example, that Battlecopter will get a 70% bonus to its attack, which means that it will one-shot things very easily. And as a result, like, you can have a Battlecopter that feels like a bomber almost. Like, it will, it will do so much damage. If you load Tasha into an actual bomber, that bomber will pretty much one-shot anything it touches. That's really good. However, here's the problem, okay? So you're up against Tasha. What are you gonna do? Well, you know she's gonna load herself into a, an air unit. So, of course, you have an anti -air ready. It's a little bit similar to going up against Eagle in Advanced Wars 2 and 1. You know, you, you know that he's going to have air units, so you just prepare an anti in response. And this is exactly what people are going to do against you if you play Tasha. Yeah, sure, if you are able to take your opponent by surprise, if they, for whatever reason, don't prepare an anti -air, yeah, your initial Battlecopter can do a lot of damage. But the moment that anti -air is out on the field, even though you do get 20% extra defense, which gets put up to 50% on your CO unit, an anti-air is still going to do a lot of damage to a Tasha Battlecopter. Even with 50% defense, that anti-air will still hurt a lot. Even in a bomber, you know, if you if you have your CO unit loaded into a, like a bomber or fighter, yeah, you can actually take a, a couple of anti-air shots, but it's still going to hurt you quite badly. And so, while this, in, in theory, this is pretty strong, because every opponent is going to know exactly how to counter it, it doesn't really end up being that great. Now, uh, Tasha's CO power, Sonic Boom, is even more lackluster, in my opinion. Uh, it increases mobility for all air units by two, so basically two movement to all her units. And I don't really like this. I, I don't think passively buffing the movement of your air units is that important, because here's the thing. Air units already have a lot of move. They're usually more mobile than many other units, and they're usually within range of what you want them to attack. Now, if air units had some sort of Kanto ability from Fire Emblem that would allow them to, like, use their remaining movement after attacking, plus two movement would have been insane. But with air units, buffing their movement more often than not is kind of overkill. It doesn't really help them get out of harm's way. I mean, either you either attack with an air unit or you withdraw with the air unit. This is why, why Eagle's Lightning Drive from Dual Strike is so broken, because it literally allows them to do hit-and-run attacks. Sonic Boom isn't going to let you do hit-and-run attacks. It's just going to slightly boost the movement of your already high-movement airplanes. It's not really going to change a lot of your gameplay. I mean, okay, so the idea, I get it. The idea is to set up a lot of Battlecopters and Bombers, get your CO power, pop Sonic Boom, and then for for one turn, you have insanely mobile aircraft with 40% extra attack and 20% extra defense. But the thing is, even with that 20% extra defense that you get, Antire is still going to wreck your day. And any good player will build a wall of Antire in response to this push. Air units just don't work like that. Air units are not units that you cluster up and push with. Air units are harassers, they are scouts, they are hit and runners. This is how you use them. If, if a Tasha player clumps up a giant ball of bombers and battlecopters in an attempt to do like a death push with Sonic Boom, all you're gonna do is run into a wall of anti-air and just get killed on the next turn. Um, now, I will, I will admit, like, if she actually gets her Sonic Boom off, her bombers will easily be able to pick off Antire, at least if they're not on properties. But any good player will position his Antire well in response. So, yeah, no, I don't think Tasha is very good. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe Tasha's like incredibly good if you use her right. Feel free to tell me in the comment section 
uh, how I'm wrong and how you're supposed to play Tasha, but based on the few matches I've had playing with her and against her, I was not very impressed. She is hella hot, though. And then we come to the indirect combat specialist, Gage, and uh, man, he is looking quite handsome in this game. I don't know why all the Days of Ruin commanders are so pretty, I mean, just look at them, it's like if Grit became a Calvin Klein model. Anyway, this guy is quite good, he's a b wang tier commander in this game. He has a CO zone of 2, which is pretty good, gives him some decent range, and it buffs naval units and indirect combat units by giving them 20% extra firepower and 10% extra defense. So there's a lot of things you can do with Gage. I mean, the most obvious is, of course, put him into an artillery or rocket and just go ham with it. I mean, it's going to be quite insane. But the reason why he has good naval units is not just to give him some more versatility, but it's because of battleships. And this is insane. If you can get Gage inside a battleship on a naval map, oh my god, it becomes so powerful. Now, of course, battleships and advanced wars have historically been a little bit of a meme. They're very overpriced. I mean, I tend to call them glorified rockets. However, in Days of Ruin, they received a huge buff. Not only did they reduce their pricing from 28,000 down to 25,000, but battleships now have the insane ability to move and shoot in the same turn. This gives them crazy mobility and reach. I mean, like, the fact that you can't pin them down as easily just makes them so much easier to use. I mean, of course, one of the reasons why battleships were so hard to use in the older games was the fact that they had to set up to shoot. So they were very vulnerable to bombers, battlecopters, submarines. Now, battleships can just run all over the map and just shoot as they go, and they're incredibly good as a result. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And if you manage to put Gage inside a battleship, and it's on a map where a battleship can be relatively effective, I mean, that is incredibly powerful. So, yeah, he's a very versatile commander. Of course, on smaller maps, you're not really going to be able to afford a battleship, so that means you will probably be relying on artillery and rockets. Now, one of the things that I really like about indirect units and a CO zone that buffs indirects is the fact that, unlike air units, who you kind of want to spread out over the map, indirect units are kind of strong when they're clumped together. Like, if you have a clump of three artillery together, side by side, they become very good because they cover each other. So if, if a unit tries to break through to deal damage to the artillery, it will just be shelled out of existence. You can put Gage in the middle of your indirect clump, you can just edge the, uh, the formation forward slowly bit by bit, kind of like Grit used to do in Advanced Force 1 and 2, and you can just push your opponent off the map. It's incredibly strong. Now, of course, he doesn't get any passive day-to-day -day range increase like Grit did, but his, and his indirect units will still be incredibly strong. Also, there's a new really good unit that Gage buffs the hell out of, and that is the Anti-Tank. The Anti-Tank is a new vehicle introduced in Days of Ruin. It is a very strange unit. It is both a direct and an indirect unit at the same time. It can shoot into melee, it can defend itself, it actually has decent defenses, but it also has range, and it can shoot and do incredible damage to tanks. It's even good against infantry, and it can even take shots at battlecopters as well. It doesn't do that much to them, but it can still do a little bit of damage. So anti-tanks are just incredibly versatile units, and putting Gage inside an anti-tank is very viable. It turns it into a really strong unit that can one-shot pretty much any tank, uh, and this allows you to build up his CO power, which is even better. I mean, Gage has long shot. I mean, if you played Grit and you've seen Super Snipe, you know what this does. Gives plus two range to every single one of his indirects. It's so insanely good. I mean, in addition to that, of course, it also gives 20% firepower because his zone becomes global. So for one turn, you just become Grit. And, like, the, the amount of damage you can do with this power is incredible. Just the, the battleships alone will be so good, especially considering they can move and then shoot with plus two range. I mean, the only commander who's better at this is Isabella, but, yeah, she's a bit of a, an oddity, so it's not fair to compare Gage, compare Gage to her. But, yeah, no, this is incredible. I mean... You get long shot, you're gonna do a lot of damage. And this is definitely the sort of power that you just wanna pop right away, in my opinion. Especially if you can take a lot of good shots with it. But yeah, Gage, he's an incredibly strong commander. Uh, he doesn't have reduced firepower on his direct units like Grit used to have in Advanced Force. Of course, Grit used to have a day to day plus one range. So I guess that's kinda how they made up for it. You know, Gage doesn't have weaker units because there are no weaknesses in Days of Ruin. There are no commanders with weak units in that game. And as a result, Gage can use his direct units just fine. I mean, they even benefit from that 10% firepower and defense when they are within a CO zone. So make sure you protect Gage's uh, indirects properly. You can definitely do it. And don't just stick to spamming artillery. You definitely want to build some tanks every now and then with Gage, some recon, some infantry. You know, you don't just want to be a one-trick pony and pony and just build infantry and rock. Oh, sorry, just build artillery and rockets. That's not a very good playstyle. It worked with Grit. With Gage, I'd say you pro should probably vary your units a little bit more. But yeah, as I said, if you can afford battleships uh, with Gage, then they are absolutely incredible. So yeah, he's a, he's a really strong commander. 
also probably has the best CO theme in the entire damn game. I mean, just listen to it. Jesus Christ. So up next, we come to the leader of the Lasurian army, the Honorable Commander Forsyth, and one of my personal favorites in Days of Ruin, actually, I really like this guy. Just like with Adder of the previous games, Forsyth is an excellent example of how minimalistic CO designs can lead to very exciting playstyles, and Forsyth is a lot of fun to play. He may not seem like much, he's a very simple CO, but he ends up being a lot of fun to play nevertheless. Also on a side note, a little bit of trivia for you guys here, did you ever ask yourself why his CO theme sounds like it's taken straight out of Radiant Dawn. I mean, just listen to it. It sounds like a Radiant Dawn OSD. Well, that's because one of the composers who worked on the music for Days of Ruin also worked on Radiant Dawn. So that's a, just a fun little thing I want to add there. His CO theme is incredibly cool. Um, anyway, Forsyth, as much as I love him, he's not a very strong commander. I would classify him as a C-ranked tier commander. Uh, so how does he work? Well, it's quite simple. Um, Forsyth has the biggest CO zone in the game. It starts out at 5, which is the maximum, by the way. And since it is the maximum, that means the his CO zone will not level up. He doesn't even have, like, a CO power meter. It, it, it's no, there's no point, because his CO zone literally cannot expand any further. So it stays consistently at 5, which is massive. I mean, it, like, covers half the map. It's incredible. Uh, however, its benefits is only the vanilla benefits that every other CO gets. So he only buffs his units by 10% firepower and defense. So it's not very significant but it will affect a large part of the map and it's very easy to get value out of it because you keep see foresight in the middle of your army you can pretty much ensure that almost every single engagement that you take will get a 10 percent buff to firepower and defense and over the course of a long match that really starts to add up now of course foresight doesn't have a co power so he will never get any stronger he's kind of like a pre-promote in fire emblem he starts out incredibly strong but he doesn't get any stronger so if you can push his advantage early on and overwhelm his enemy before they can get their CO power, then he's in a very good position to win the game. If you can somehow take out the enemy CO unit and prevent them from using their power at all, well, that's amazing for Forsyth. But he doesn't really have any special tricks up his sleeve. He can't deploy himself into a unit and make it super strong and, like, do a mega push. He's just consistently very good. And that can both be good and bad. If you're up against a CO that has, like, a really powerful gimmick, then, C then Forsyth might struggle a little bit to go up against that. But if he's playing on a very large map, and you can really make sure that that CO zone is always present on his engagement, and I personally find this a lot of fun to do. This is why I love his playstyle, because I always try to position Forsyth in such a way that I will get as many good engagements as possible. And this is, as I said, this is just incredibly fun to do. I, I really love playing as this guy. But he's not very strong. I will say, though, that one thing I really like about Forsyth is that you don't really need to care that much if your CO units gets taken out. With the other commander, you kind of want to guard them frivolously. Having your CO unit shot down, especially when you're about to get your power, is like almost a game-breaking move. Uh, you know, it's so annoying to just, ah, I'm almost getting my power, and then boom, your CO unit gets focused down. With Forsyth, you don't really care as much, because you can just deploy him back on the field, and the huge CO zone will usually be back in action within one or two turns. It's like, ah, you, you killed my Forsyth, ah, okay, I can just get another one, you know? And that is incredibly nice, when whenever I play as Forsyth, I don't really care as much about my CO unit. Sometimes I put him into a bike. I literally put him into a bike, because the bike allows for great mobility, so what I do is... Uh, I start out, I take engagements inside the CO zone, and then I just bike him up to the next area and use my CO zone all over again in the span of one turn. Uh, because, of course, you can use your CO zone both before and after you move. So if you're very smart and you put Foresight into a very mobile unit, you can ensure that that CO zone is practically present in every single engagement that you take. Very few other COs can do this. Uh, Foresight is very unique in this regard. So... While I am rating him as a C-ranked tier CO, I will say that if you're very skilled at utilizing mobility and you're very good at planning ahead, maybe I could go as far as saying that Forsyth would be like a B-ranked tier commander. He has a very high skill gap, which I really like. So up next, we come to the lovable douchebag Whalen, probably one of my favorite personalities from the Days of Ruin campaign. He was just such a breath of fresh air, because, you know, either the the characters in Days of Ruin are, like, super virtuous or they're mega evil. Whereas Whalen, I mean, he definitely was evil, there was no question about that, but he was kind of, like, evil in a way where he, he owned it, in a way. He was just sort of like a douche. He was a selfish, arrogant douche, but he kind of wallowed in it and kind of just owned what he was. And he prided himself on at least being an honest douchebag, which... You know, I, I think there's some merit to that, you know, the honest douchebag. 
And by the freaking gods, his Theo theme slaps so incredibly hard. I love this theme so much. I've listened to it so much. It's probably my favorite track from Days of Ruin as a whole. I love how silly it starts out, and then just it just goes bang! And man, it just... I, I really love it. There's a really... Uh, there's a comment with a bunch of upvotes on this video uh, that, that points out something incredibly interesting about Waylon, and I think this might be intentional. When you first encounter Waylon in the campaign, there's this mission where he only controls a single unit, and so his, his faces don't last for more than a couple of seconds. And so the only thing you hear when his theme starts is the, the silly build-up, you know, like... And then it stops. And this leads you to believe that Waylon is just some silly comical gag character. Uh, but then when he actually reveals himself to be evil, that's when you hear the entire theme. And you hear just how evil he sounds. And it's just, I don't know, it's a really cool introduction to a character. I don't know if it's intentional, but if it was, it was really well done by the developers. Anyway, uh, you're here to... T <laughs> You're here to hear me talk about tier rankings, not the story, I guess. Anyway, um, Waylon is the first character in Days of Ruin that I am very unsure about in terms of how to rank him. Because on paper, I definitely see the crazy potential that he has. But personally, I've never been able to make Waylon work myself, and I haven't seen anyone play him well. Currently, I rate him as a C-ranked tier CO. But I will say that I am definitely open to being proven wrong here, because when I look at Whalen's kit, I see a CO that can be used in very interesting ways, because there hasn't really been a CO like Whalen ever in an Advanced Wars game. You remember how I called Tasha the aggressive air specialist? Well, Whalen is the defensive air specialist, and having a air-based CO that focuses on defense is extremely unique. Uh, so let's talk about Waylon's uh, abilities first. He has a CO zone of two, so that's one more than Tasha had. And all air units within the zone gets 20% extra firepower and 40% extra defense. Now, normally I'm not a very big fan of giving defense to air units. Um, Anti-air will kind of cripple them anyway because their base damage is just so high. And it's not like they can take a hit from missiles either. But when they get a 40% buff to their defense, it actually starts to hit a point where his air units actually become very hard to take down. Again, anti-air units will still shoot down your Battlecopters, even with it, even with this buff, but other Battlecopters going toe-to-toe -to -toe with your Battlecopters, for example, they will actually struggle to deal damage. And Fighters versus Fighter, for example, very hard to go up against Fighters with Fighters of your own when the enemy Fighters have 40% extra defense. That's actually pretty insane. And not to mention that when you load Whalen into a CO unit, I mean, that CO unit will have a 70% uh, increase to its defense. Antire will still hurt it a little bit, but it's very hard to do damage to Whale on CO unit. And that means he can fly around in a Battlecopter and actually do a lot of damage with it, and it's incredibly hard to pin it down. So, again, I definitely see the potential that Whalen has. And in particular, in regards to his CO powers, just probably one of the most unique CO powers I've ever seen. It's called Wingman, and when he pops it, his air units gets a crazy boost to their defense for one turn. They practically becomes untouchable for a turn. Empire, I do believe, if I remember correctly, will deal somewhere around 25 to 30 percent damage against his Battlecopters. So that gives you an idea of just how much defense he gets. Uh, most of his air units will take zero percent during Wingman. So basically, it's just he becomes untouchable for a turn, and the the potential that this has is insane. You can ride in with all your bombers, bomb the enemy anti-air. You can really focus on just taking down all the anti-air as much as possible. You know, just go for every single anti-air unit that you can see. You take no damage on the retaliation. The enemy can't touch you on their face. And then when your next turn rolls in, maybe you've taken out enough anti-air units so that your air units can dominate the skies. Again, I think a skilled Whalen player can really make this work. Maybe if he has a little bit of scouting and maybe some luck. Uh, but I think that any player worth their salt going up against Whalen will probably over-prepare a bunch of anti-air in response to this. Uh, and also, like, what I would do is, if I'm noticing that Whalen is about to get his CO power, I would pull all my anti-air back. You know, I see that that CO power is coming. Uh, you cannot activate a CO power mid-turn if you've taken a, a turn with your CO unit. So, as long as you know it's not coming this turn, and you see that he's about to get built up, I would, I would definitely like spread my entire out and pull them back as much as possible because I, I can sense that a wingman is coming. And I think that, that again, Whalen seems like a player that has a, or a CO that has a very high skill gap, but the opponent can also equally prepare around it if their skill is very high. So this is why I find it incredibly hard to rate Whalen. Uh, as I said with Tasha, I, I'm not a big fan of CO zones that buffs air units because, again, 
Uh, air units are supposed to be harassers. They're not meant to be mainline units. They just don't have the staying power to stay around for very long. And even with a 40% defense boost, I don't see Battlecopters or Dusters surviving against Antire. It's just not going to happen. And anyone who goes up against Whalen will build a crap ton of Antire just in response to that. But I will say, you know, I'm, I'm definitely open to being proven wrong about this one. If, if there's some very professional Whalen players out there who have used this power to great effect, if you have some videos, for example, of a match uh, playing as Whalen, I'd love to see it. But so far, I'm going to stick with my rating of a C-rank tier CO because I just I don't like CO zones that buff only air units. I don't think it's that good. Uh, but again, you know, as I've said, I'm open to being proven wrong here. So up next, we come to the madman himself, uh, the guy who will see you hanged for this. It is a Greyfield, uh, who looks absolutely amazing. I love his design. He's like every dictator just merged together into one super dictator. Um, so yeah, Greyfield though, while I love the way he looks and I also love his theme, he's not a very good commander in this game. In fact, I would actually say he's the worst CO in the game by far, a D rank, uh, the only D rank tier CO in the game actually. So, Greyfield, while I absolutely love his playstyle, it's a very fun playstyle, uh, it's not a very good playstyle, because in most matches you simply won't have the economy to support it. So, um, Greyfield, he's a naval commander, uh, but he also has some synergy with battlecopters and seaplanes, which is kind of interesting. Uh, he has a very big CO zone of 3, one of the biggest in the game. It can grow up to the maximum size of 5 once it's fully powered up, and he buffs Naval units, seaplanes, and botocopters, giving them 10% attack and 40% defense. So he's a defensive-oriented CO. Now, I do like the fact that he buffs seaplanes and copters. I'll talk a little bit about what seaplanes are afterwards. But uh, first, you know, it, he can absolutely make... Uh, he can make something happen with that power. Like, he, his botocopters are incredibly hard to take down. They have as much defense as Whalen, but they lack the firepower that Whalen has. And so I don't think it's a, a very good CO zone. Uh, and here's the thing about naval units in Days of Ruin. Yes, battleships are terrific. Battleships received a huge buff in Days of Ruin. They are now actually amazing if you can afford them. The rest of the naval units, though, still very overpriced. There were some reduction in prices here and there, but overall, I'd say naval units still still not something you want to focus on unless the map literally forces you to. I will add that if you're forced to play on like an island-based maps with no airport, yeah, maybe I would bump Greyfield up a tier. Possibly, but if there are airports on the map and you can kind of avoid the naval units, then I don't think Grateful becomes very good. Now, um, seaplanes is a very unique unit. It's a unit introduced in Days of Ruin. Basically, uh, aircraft carriers are in this game. They're very expensive. They cost 28,000. And how they work is that they can build a unit called the seaplane. They cost 15,000. So just to get a seaplane, you have to invest 43,000, which is insane. This is why I say you're just not going to be able to take advantage of Greyfield's toolkit in most matches. In order for Greyfield to work, you need to play on a crazy high economy map. There needs to be tons of properties. You need to have a, an absolutely insane amount of income because otherwise you're just not going to be able to afford it. I mean, who can afford 43,000 for two units? That's insane. Now, I will say, I have actually played a few matches with Greyfield, and I've been able to actually utilize seaplanes, and I will say that once you get them going, they are actually incredible. So, seaplanes, as I said, they cost 15,000, they're built from carriers. Each carrier can build up to four seaplanes over the course of a match, and, uh, I mean, they're incredibly good. They are very versatile, they can attack almost any unit. They have very low ammo and fuel, so they're very reliant on going back to the aircraft carrier to get refueled. But, I mean, once you have a, a carrier on the field with four seaplanes in it, they can actually do a crazy amount of damage, because, you see, aircraft carriers can launch air units, allowing them to move and attack in the same turn they come out, which is incredibly good. They're not like a transport copter that has to spend their entire turn loading the unit off. They can shoot out the airplanes, and then the airplane can attack right away. And as a result, if you can utilize Greyfield zone and keep those seaplanes within his defensive boost, yeah, they're incredibly hard to take down and very... Well, I, I hesitate I hesitate to say they're cost effective because uh, 15,000 is an insane investment for a single airplane, especially when you have to build an aircraft carrier worth 28,000. 
But I will say that if you are playing in a very big scale match with tons of properties, yes, you can absolutely make something happen with seaplanes. I've done it a couple of times, and once you get the once you get it rolling, it is hell a lot of fun to play. Like really, it is a really fun playstyle. Just shooting out all those seaplanes, attacking right, left, right, and center, pulling them back to the aircraft carrier. They will also be repaired on the aircraft carrier, so they'll restart their HP, and then you shoot them out again. And it's just, again, it's a lot of fun. It's it's a lot of fun, and. It is very hard to take down Greyfield's battleships too. With a 40% defense buff, they become incredibly tough to kill. Sadly though, the, the fact that they don't get that much extra firepower makes Greyfield very hard to use because battleships, they're an, they're an offensive unit. They want to kill things. Yeah, sure, it's nice that his battleships don't die, but it would be nicer if they killed things. In, in this regard, I prefer Gage's battleships more because they get that 20% firepower buff and his CO power increases their range by two, which just makes them a lot more versatile, in my opinion. So, the reason why Greyfield is so weak is that he's a naval specialist that isn't even the best in terms of naval units, and his, his playstyle and toolkit is just, it's so pricey that in 90% of all matches you will just never see them at all. But I will add that when you actually get to play around with them, then they are a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, now, I haven't talked about his CO power, because his CO power is not very good. It's called Supply Chain. Once he activates it, he refuels fuel, ammo, and materials. Now, fuel and ammo, you know what that is if you play the other Advanced Force games. Now, what is materials? Well, every aircraft carrier that you have can build up to four um, seaplanes, basically. And once they do that, they run out of building materials, and they cannot build anymore. Well, Greyfield has the ability to resupply the building materials. He can build more seaplanes. APCs are called rigs in this game, and they can create something called a temporary airport. Uh, or a temporary harbor, which is basically just a place where you can resupply your and repair your air, air units and naval units. And once a rig uh, deploys a temporary airport or dock, then it runs out of building materials, and it cannot do that again for the rest of the match. Even if you put it on a city and resupply it, it will not get its building materials back. So Greyfield is the only commander who can restore building materials, but it's just not very good. Uh, like, I would honestly almost never pop Supply Chain. I would just sit on a CO Sona 5 and utilize the defense. The only time I would ever use his Supply Chain is if my battleship was out of ammo and couldn't shoot. That's literally the only time I would use Supply Chain. Maybe I would use it if I was about to do a huge naval push, and I wanted that 40% defense globally for every single boat that I had. But the thing is, when your CO Zone is 5, it is so easy for it to affect most of your army if you know how to position your units. So you shouldn't really need to pop Supply Chain. Again, it's a very situational power. You'll almost never see it when you go up against Greyfield. And as a result, he's just not a very good CO. Again, his, his CO Zone is lackluster, his playstyle is too expensive, and his CO power is just too situational. Too bad, because I think it's a lot of fun to play, but yeah, I mean, there's gotta be some people in the bottom tier. You know, every game's gotta have a flack. So up next, we come to maybe one of the most weird, creepy, and disturbing characters ever added to Advanced Wars. I personally think this character is the mastermind behind everything that went down in Days of Ruin, probably even the reason why the meteors fell from the sky in the first place. It is none other than the enigmatic Mr. Bear. And Mr. Bear carries with him his personal cord into battle, the CO Penny. And Penny is probably one of the most unique commanders in Days of Ruin because she is the only one that has a global day-to-day -day power. No other CO in the game has that. Now Penny, she does have a CO zone, and all it does is uh, basically the same thing that every other CO zone does, you know, the passive 10% bonus to firepower and defense. And it has a range of three, which is all right, but she's a little bit similar to Isabella in this regard, in the fact that her CO zone is nothing special. However, she makes up for this by having a global day-to-day -day ability that all of her units on the field will just ignore the effects of weather. So she's a little bit like Olaf and Drake from the previous games, except that she likes all kinds of weather. She just doesn't care about it. So many people think that, that this, own, this effect only applies within her CO zone, but that is not true. Uh, no matter where her units are on the battlefield, they will just not care about weather. Now, for this reason, I don't think Penny's like super strong. Uh, I classify her as a C rank tier CO. However, I will add that if you're playing with random weather on, then she definitely jumps up to B rank. Because random weather in Days of Ruin happens almost all the time. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but the few matches that I've played with random weather has me seeing weather pretty much like every other turn. It's quite insane. Uh, also, for some reason, they changed the way weather works in Days of Ruin, especially random weather, in that uh, you can actually get rain on just a single turn. Like, 
In the older Advanced Wars games, if it started to rain or snow, it would rain or snow for the entire turn. Every CO would have to go through it. But in Days of Ruin, it can actually start to rain on your turn and then end on the, the your opponent's turn. So weather is a lot more random and unpredictable, and it can screw one player over but not the other, which is really strange. Um, they've also changed the way weather works uh, as a whole. There are three types of weather in Days of Ruin. You have snow, rain, and sandstorms. Now, snow... Uh, it still works similarly to how it used to work in the first two games. Uh, in Advanced Wars 1 or 2, snow used to slow down your movement by a lot. You would basically have your movement halved in the snow. And then the uh, Dual Strike came in and was like, hey, hey it, no, it doubles fuel consumption. And everyone was like, no, that's really dumb. And so I'm glad to see that Days of Ruin changed this back. Uh, however, it's not as severe as, as it used to be. Honestly, I think snow in Days of Ruin is kind of cool because it's, it's, a, it's a nice middle ground. It only reduces mobility by one. So if your infantry move three in the snow, they will move two. So it's a minor inconvenience. It can certainly screw you over. I mean, if you were planning to take a, an engagement and maybe now your unit won't be able to reach its target. So it definitely is annoying and Penny being able to ignore that gives her a, a mobility advantage, but it's no longer as crippling as it used to be. Uh, the second time type of weather in Days of Ruin is rain. And that works pretty much identical to how it worked in Dual Strike. It causes Fog of War on the map for a turn, or for the duration of the rain, if there is no Fog of War. And in addition to that, it also reduces Vision Rate by one for every single unit. And Penny ignores this. This is how Drake should have worked in the previous games, in my opinion, but they didn't do that for some reason. Uh, so yeah, you will basically have no Vision in the rain. You'll be very dependent on using your Flares to scout ahead. So, Penny will get a very big vision uh, advantage whenever it rains. However, the rain can also screw her over if you're not playing with Fog of War, because it still enables Fog of War for all commanders. So, Penny can still have her vision range reduced, she just doesn't get it reduced as much as the other COs. The third type of weather in Days of Ruin is Sandstorms. And Sandstorms, uh, are they work very differently to how they worked in Dual Strike. In Dual Strike, they only reduced range of all indirects. Uh, in Days of Ruin, Sandstorms will we reduce firepower across the board by 30%, but not for Penny, of course. So essentially, you can sort of treat this as Penny getting a 30% defense boost in the Sandstorm. Not quite, because firepower and defense doesn't work uh, in similar ways, but it basically almost works like that. So Penny will get a huge survival boost in the Sandstorm, and for that reason, I do believe the Sandstorms are by far the most valuable type of weather for her. Because rain, yeah, it's annoying, and snow, it's a little annoying, but sandstorms actually makes Penny's units a lot harder to kill across the board. Uh, so I definitely think this is the kind of weather that you want when playing as Penny. Now, of course, Penny has a CO power, uh, Stormfront, and uh, it changes weather conditions, as you, as you might predict. I mean, that's a pretty standard power for a weather-dependent CO. However, uh, Stormfront is very unreliable. You, you have no control over what kind of weather it causes. And it also has different durations depending on the weather that it summons. If it happens to cause rain, it will only rain for one full turn. However, if you get snow or sandstorm, it will last for three turns, which is massive. Now, I don't know why they felt the need to make uh, rains last so much shorter than snowstorms uh, and uh, sandstorms. But I can only imagine that they thought Vision would be a lot more crippling. Personally, I whenever I play as Penny, I'm hoping that I'll get that uh, Sandstorm because three turns of reducing the enemy's uh, attack power by 30% is actually pretty massive. Uh, however, the, unreli the unreliability of this power makes it incredibly tricky to use because, you know, you never know what kind of weather is going to be coming in. And for that reason, Penny is tough because you can't plan around that. At least when you played as Olaf in the previous games, whenever you got your power, you knew it was going to snow for a day. Whereas with Penny, it's like a one in three chance. And sure, all the different effects are nice in one way or another, but personally, I would just go for Sandstorm every single time if I had the ability to actually decide the weather. And yeah, that does make Penny a little bit tricky to use. However, I mean, if you're playing with random weather, she becomes a lot stronger because you're going to see that weather come in all the freaking time. I swear to God, it almost seems like there's like a 50% chance of weather to occur in Days of Ruin. It's absolutely crazy. So if you're playing against a Penny player and they insist on playing with random weather, uh, you should definitely not allow them to do that because they will be way, 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 way stronger. So yeah, Penny. Interesting CO. Maybe I'm underselling the effect of her power a little bit, but in my opinion... Uh, especially if you're playing with Claire Weather, I don't really find her that good. So finally, we arrive at my cruel, lovely little rose, Tabitha. In case you were wondering, 
you know, who my Days of Ruin waifu is. There she is. I absolutely love her. I mean, just, ah, her design is so good, man. Just those high heels and the corset, she just looks so good. I oh, man, she's not really evil, guy. She's just misunderstood. She just has some daddy issues. I mean, she has cold as a freaking dad. Like, cut her some slack. We, we can reform her. We can make her good. I, I promise, guys. She's, she's just misunderstood. Anyway, uh, Tabita. Uh, I think she's an incredibly good CO. I would classify her as an A-ranked tier CO. But I have a feeling a lot of people are going to disagree with this, because prior to making this video, I did look up some message boards just to, you know, see some discussion. I tried to gauge what people's opinions of the various CEOs were. And with Tamita, I saw a lot of discussion, because some people claim she's, like, completely broken and that there's no way to counter her. Other people claim that she's a joke. Um, and I think one of the reasons why people are so conflicted on Tamita is the fact that she is a very all-in type of CEO. She either completely dominates or she, com she just dies. So, Tamita is one of the more unique CEOs in the game. She is a CEO zone of zero. So she literally has no CEO zone. This means that the only unit that will get buffed from Tabita is one unit, and that is her CEO unit. Now, she can level up her CEO zone twice like everyone else can, but it starts out at zero. So that means that all you have to work with in the early game is one single unit. However, that one single unit is going to be incredibly strong because her CO zone buffs firepower and defense for all units by 50%, which is ridiculous. Now keep in mind, once you load your CO into a unit, you level it up to max rank, which is 30% extra firepower and defense. So when you combine these two things together, Tabita's CO unit gets a whopping 80% firepower and defense. That is absolutely insane. Like, if you load Tabita into something durable like a war tank, the amount of focus fire that your opponent has to bring to bear to get that thing down is insane. Like, they literally have to focus their entire army on one unit. They can either do that or they can ignore it, but that means that the CO unit can just ride around, have a field day, and just one-shot units left, right, and center. With an 80% buff to your firepower, you are very likely to just straight up one-shot whatever you attack, especially if you're inside something strong, like... Again, a war tank. But I've definitely seen Tabita utilized in other ways as well. Like, for example, uh, I've seen people put her into a recon and just, like, really be aggressive early on. Just run around with that recon and one-shot infantry and dominate the capture game. I've seen people put Tabita inside a battlecopter and just run around and one-shot tanks with that battlecopter. I've seen people put her inside a rocket, and they basically have a rocket that can one-shot anything that comes within its range. And that also allows you to build up Tabita's CO power. Which is very interesting, it's literally Sturm's Meteor Strike. That's what it is, it's called Firestorm. And it shoots a missile, uh, which is shaped in the exact same form as the Meteor Strike was, that deals 8 HP damage. Which is ridiculous, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you get this, you should definitely pop it. Uh, sure, it means your CO zone goes back to zero, but keep in mind, you also get a global Tabita zone for one turn. So 8 HP damage, 50% firepower and defense globally across the map, if you don't win with that, there's something seriously wrong. Now, I've seen some people say that you should hold on to her CO zone of two, and I can definitely see the argument for wanting a CO zone that buffs firepower and defense by 50%. But in my opinion, uh, if you get Firestorm, you'd be an idiot not to pop it, because the amount of power that you will generate for a single turn should be enough to win you the game. Again, you are either in the biggest stalemate of your life on the biggest map, or you are incredibly far behind if a Firestorm won't win you the game. Like, seriously guys, 50% firepower and defense for your entire army for a single turn? That is like Samurai Spirit and Meteor Strike worked into one. Like, that is absolutely incredible, I don't care what anyone says. If you get Firestorm, you pop that damn thing. So, again, Tabata, very interesting unit. Uh, I can definitely see why people think she's incredibly annoying to go up against, because, like, you'll just have, like, a super unit on the field that is incredibly hard to deal with. I definitely think you should place her inside something durable that you can put on the front lines, like a war tank. Uh, I think that is probably the best way to utilize her, because then you, you're just forcing your, your, your opponent to divert so much firepower to deal with that one single unit. I'm not a very big fan of putting her inside something fragile, like a recon or a battlecopter, because... At the end of the day, 80% defense is terrific, but if you're inside a battlecopter, it can still get shot down by anti-iron missiles. So you're taking a big gamble there, whereas a war tank, like, no matter what your opponent does, they will have to divert a large part of their army to deal with that unit. And that, that's at least what I think is the best thing to do with her, but again, um, there are pe probably people who are way more knowledgeable about the metagame than I am that can formulate some better Tabita strategies. But yeah, no, I, I think she's incredibly dangerous. 
And uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from the opinion of people who don't think she's good exactly how you're supposed to counter her, because I haven't seen a good way yet. And at long last, we arrive at the final bad guy of Days of Ruin, the mad scientist Calder, and oh my god, this guy. Hoo -hoo. You know, I heard the stories about him when I started playing Days of Ruin, and when I reached those final few maps in the campaign, oh my god, they were intense. Take note, Dual Strike, this is how you design a final CO of your game. I don't care that he's not balanced, like, the final boss of an Advanced Wars game should be an s rank tier CO, and that's exactly what Calder is. He's THE s rank tier CO of this game. No one else can touch this guy, he is quite literally in a tier of his own. And that's where he should be. Like, that's literally where he should be. It's kind of disappointing when the final boss of your game ends up in A-rank, don't you think? Well, not so with Colder. This guy lives up to Sturm's legacy as a very frightening last boss of Advanced Wars. I also think it's hilarious, by the way, that, you know, the, the entire conflict starts with, like, a meteor strike. I don't think that's coincidental. So... Yeah, Colder, he is absolutely ridiculous. Where to even begin with this guy? So you remember Tabitha's CO zone, how it used to work? How it gave 50% firepower and defense to a single unit? And that was pretty good, right? Pretty hard to deal with. Colder has that exact same CO zone, except that it has three range instead of zero. So yeah, you're you're screwed, pretty much. But wait, there's more. In case that wasn't enough, that alone would have been broken on its own. Like, that alone would still make him an s rank tier CO. But in addition to giving all of his units 50% extra firepower and defense, in a 3-tile radius, every single unit within Calder's zone recovers 5 HP at the start of his turn. So that is quite literally like having your own little Andy running around popping his hyper upgrade at the start of his turn. And that, that is absolutely bizarre to think about just how broken that is. Now, I will add, there's a caveat to this power. It will drain his funds, like repairs on a city. And sure, I mean, if you can somehow drain Calder of money, then he can't repair anymore, I guess? But you'll still have to deal with the 50% firepower and defense. Like, uh, honestly, the 5 HP repair is just in adding insult to injury. Like, you would have died from the 50% firepower and defense. And on top of that, he just heals himself up to full. So it's honestly just like a slap in your face. I mean, there, there is no chance in hell you're gonna be able to, to deal with this guy, unless you're playing Calder yourself. Basically, when you play as Calder, there's only one strategy. You load him up in any unit of your choice, you make a death ball, and you push that death ball into your enemy's base, and they can do absolutely nothing to stop you. Your units will have a 50% firepower and defense advantage over them, so they'll just kill everything and they'll never die. And if the opponent somehow manages to put a dent in them, it'll just get healed up at the start of your turn. It doesn't matter that he drains your money. It's, once you get the death ball rolling, you don't need to recruit any more units, because you'll win with that push no matter what. Colder doesn't even have a CO power, which I thought was a little bit weird, but then I realized that you know his CO zone is so broken that he would never need to pop his power anyway. And if he had a power, I mean, that would probably just be like, you win the game. You know, like, I, I do actually think he should have had a power, though. Like, like it would have been cool if he had one. Uh, it could have been something absolutely devastating. Like, maybe he just infects you all with a creeper or something and you should all die. I don't know. Something like that would have actually been pretty cool. But I also understand why they felt like, you know, his CO zone is just so broken so that he doesn't, doesn't need a power. His, his CO power is literally his CO zone. So... Yeah, no, he is absolutely ridiculous. Probably the most broken CO ever. Uh, I've seen many debates on, like, people People say, like, who is, who's the most broken CO, Calder versus Sturm. It's a hard matchup to do because the COs work so differently in Days of Ruin compared to Advanced Wars. You know, Sturm just passively buffs everyone in his army, whereas Calder only has the CO zone. But I actually think that if you somehow were to simulate a match between the two, um, I actually think Calder would have the edge over Sturm, because, yeah, sure, while Sturm has the 20% firepower and defense boost and the ability to move through terrain, and he does have that incredibly powerful Meteor Strike, Calder rolls in with a blob of 50-50 units that heals. And I actually think if they were to go face-to-face -face in a match, if you somehow were to, like, incorporate the two games into one, I actually think Calder would beat Sturm because of that initial push. If Sturm could hold out until he got his Meteor Strike, then I think Sturm would win. But if Calder could early push him, 
I mean, keep in mind, even after Sturm's firepower and defense, Colder would literally have a 30% firepower and defense left over. See, it would almost be like going up against Kumbai units with a vanilla CO. That's how strong Colder would be compared to Sturm. So just think a little bit about that. And that's not even taking into account the healing that he gets. So yeah, actually, I actually think Colder would beat Sturm, which is insane to think about. But yeah, in case you didn't get it, this guy's really broken. Don't, don't play him. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, and with that, the tier list is officially done. Here it is in all of its glory. As always, you can pause the video, you can screenshot it, you can do whatever you want, laugh at it. I mean, I guess someone probably will. Uh, I did feel a little underqualified to make this video, and I probably got some things wrong. Uh, but I like to think, or I, I hope that I at least got the CEOs somewhat right in their respective tier. And, you know, if you happen to be a very experienced Days of Rune player, definitely make a comment telling me what I got right and what I got wrong. And I love seeing big, long, informative comments, man, with tons of reasoning and arguments backing up everything. Like, I, I love that stuff. I am always looking to increase my advanced force knowledge. So, hopefully, you know, even though maybe I didn't get everything right in this video, I do hope that I at least got m some of it right and that I was able to gauge the CEOs somewhat in the respective tiers that they belong in. Again, I don't know anything about the Days of Ruin metagame. Uh, apparently, it is quite extensive. Apparently, the game has evolved over the years. So, you know, if, if anyone can... Uh and if anyone can keep me up to speed on that, I would definitely love to read about it. Uh, I will also say that I have heard rumors that there is a Days of Ruin by web out there somewhere. Um, I tried Googling it, but I haven't been able to find it. So if someone can point me in the right direction and tell me where I can go to play Days of Ruin online, I would definitely love to do that because I will say, making this video definitely rekindled my interest in Days of Ruin. This is definitely a game I want to learn more about and I want to play more. So. Yeah, if you know of any places where I can play it online, shoot it down in the comment section. I'm probably going to get like 100 links, but uh, I don't care. So yeah, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you got some enjoyment out of it. I hope you didn't take it too seriously, because as I said, you know, I'm not that experienced with Days of Ruin, but hopefully it was an interesting video to watch nevertheless. I certainly had a lot of fun making it. I know my editor, Davis G, was very keen on making it, so yeah, I hope you had fun making all the memes and whatnot. You're doing an incredible job with these videos, man. I am really, really grateful. Really grateful to have you as my editor. And I'm grateful to you guys for showing such interest and passion for Advanced Wars since 2021. Like, who, who could have realized that this year would be the year of Advanced Wars, man? I'm having so much fun with my YouTube channel, you guys. I, I'm so happy that Advanced Wars is finally getting the recognition that it deserves and that it's, like, on fire with the algorithm, like, right, right now. Thank you, YouTube. You did one thing right for once. Or maybe we shouldn't thank YouTube for this. Maybe we should just thank the Advanced Wars community as a whole. Maybe we were just, you know, there all along, just waiting to get catered to, and this reboot just brought us all together. I'd like to think that's the case. So no, it's not the algorithm. It's you guys. You guys are awesome. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to see uh, what more is going to happen around Advanced Wars moving forward. Maybe, just maybe, in the future, we'll get a Days of Ruin remake. One can hope, one can dream. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button, subscribe for more Advanced Wars content, and go into that comment section and tell me how wrong I am. I, I love reading comments about how wrong I am, seriously. It's the best. Anyway, guys, my name is Ben Manx. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you lovely people next time. Bye-bye.